Welcome. Uh, we're continuing on this week in our series called All I Want for Christmas. And if you tuned in uh, either in person or online last week, Pastor Kevin opened this series off talking about, um, and in a sermon titled, Peace on Earth for the Outliers. To sum up, what he was talking about was how Jesus came for the common and for the commoner rather than the privileged and the rich. And today we are discussing more about Jesus' birth and his coming as a baby, but we're focusing more on what I call the seeker's journey. Now, I don't know about you, but this time of year is a joyous time. This year, uh, <laughs> more than ever for me, is, is joyous. Uh, as many of you know, Pastor Emily and I uh, had our son approximately about 10 months ago. Um, and before kids, Christmas was always joyous. But with our firstborn son, and even though he is just a human wrecking ball most of the time, uh, it is a joyous time to be able to enjoy a lot of firsts with him and as a family. And every night before Micah goes to bed, I, I sing him a song and it will change dependent upon uh, how I'm feeling and dependent upon the mood that he is in. But I found myself a little while ago uh, singing, all I want for Christmas is my two front teeth. It was prior to him getting any teeth. Um, it's such a simple song. It's a simple request. But I want to ask you honestly, is what you want for Christmas this year so simple? Probably not. Uh, for some of you, um, personal problems are getting in the way of you being able to enjoy Christmas this year. It's getting in the way of you being able to enjoy the season and what Christmas is supposed to be all about. For you, all you want for Christmas is to be free. For others, you feel busy this year already, and you feel overworked. And it is hard for you to enjoy chestnuts roasting on an open fire. See, disillusionment at Christmas is not an unusual thing. We get so hyped up with expectations, and often we get let down, because we're often disappointed when our expectations are not met. And that brings us to our text today in Matthew 2, Verses 1 to 15. If you have a Bible with you or a Bible app, I want to encourage you to read along, follow along. Matthew 2, 1 to 15. This is what it says. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who is born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people, chief priests, and teachers of the law, he asked them, where was the Messiah to be born? In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I may go and worship him too. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose, it went ahead of them until it stopped over the place that the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary. They bowed down and worshipped him. They opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. And when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for King Herod is going to search 
to kill the child. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of King Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. See, for people in that time, now it was the first Christmas, but, but, but their Christmas wish, so you, uh, if you must, would be, I, all I want for Christmas is a king. It, it would not have been, all I want for Christmas is my two front teeth. But there is a parallel here between how the Israelites cried out for an earthly king and how God gave them one. See, the Israelites cried to God for a king, and he granted them their wish in King Saul. The difference, though, (laughs) there is so many between King Saul and King Jesus. See, King Saul was what Israel expected, okay? Um, He came from a respectable family. He was tall. He was mighty in stature. He was everything that an earthly king was supposed to be. And not only that, his crowning was done by someone that was expected. Uh, It was done by a prophet of Israel, a man that was was supposed to carry out the message of God to Israel. It was a no-brainer that he was the man that should have crowned the king. Now, King Jesus was not what Israel expected. Sure, there was prophecies written about him, and people knew what they were supposed to expect. But King Jesus did not come from the most respectable family, nor did he come from a normative family situation. Um, a woman getting pregnant in those days out of wedlock was a, usually a reason for that woman to be put to death. And then with this harebrained idea that uh, it wasn't a man that got her pregnant, but it was the Holy Spirit of God, um, many people probably thought that she was nuts. That's not a very normative family situation. Not only that, when Jesus came, he wasn't mighty when he was crowned a king. He was a baby. There's nothing mighty about a baby. (laughs) My son is 10 months old, and he's not very mighty. Um, He can be a wrecking ball, as I said, um, and he will destroy anything that he possibly can in his way. But at the end of the day, he's fragile. He, he's weak. He, he needs to be cared for. Uh, babies do not display powers of, of might. And that was how Jesus came down. Jesus' crowning was also not done by someone that met the expectations of Israel. Jesus was crowned not by men of God of Israel, Instead, he was crowned by men that were wise men from a distant country that most certainly worshipped other gods. So I'll ask you the question today, what expectations does God need to overturn in your life? See, this is what the Christmas story is all about. God coming down and defying our expectations. What unfair expectations have you placed upon God? Are you expecting him to act or respond in a certain way? Because it may not happen the way that you think. Jesus didn't do a lot of things that people expected of him in that day. People expected the Messiah to come overthrow the Roman Empire, but Jesus did not do that. Jesus did not come in the normative way that he was born. Um, He was born into a manger. He was not born in a palace like a king should. Not only did he, was he born in a not so kingly place, his kingship was not announced in a way that a king's, you know, coming should have been announced. Also, the way that he died is not the way that kings die. Kings don't die on a cross. Again, even though these things were written, they were known, the Israelites, just like you and me, just because we know something up here doesn't mean we know it here. 
Jesus did not meet the mindful expectations of Israel. And I will say the same thing, that Jesus may not meet our expectations in our heads. See, even the gifts that the wise men brought are not very expected gifts for a baby. See, gold, it was, and it still is today, currency. It's, it's money at the end of the day. It's something of value. But it was more than that. Gold was a, uh, it was a symbol of earthly kings. Okay? Um, no common person like you and me in that day would have held gold. We wouldn't have had it. But this is what they brought, a baby. And with that gift, the wise men were declaring that Jesus was king. Now, frankincense, it was used as incense. Do you know what use, incense was used for? It was burned in temples. It was incense, more specifically, frankincense, was a symbol of deity or a symbol of God. With this gift, the wise men were declaring that Jesus was God. Myrrh is the most interesting gift to give a baby. It was an embalming oil. Myrrh was used to preserve things, oftentimes dead bodies, before they were buried. Not exactly the most expected gift to give a baby. I think if I was Jesus' earthly father, Joseph, in that situation, and men brought my baby a gift of that was a symbol of death, essentially, I would have been a little offended. My expectations would not have been met. See, none of these gifts would have met the earthly expectations of any of us. But it wasn't about meeting expectations it was about wise men coming and worshipping a baby king. Not much different than the woman that anoints Jesus with expensive perfume in John 12. That instance also didn't meet the expectations of Jesus' followers. In fact, one of Jesus' disciples says this, That perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. So why not? Why did Jesus allow this to happen? Because she was worshipping him. Worship doesn't always make sense. It doesn't make sense for us to give God everything when it doesn't seem to make sense to our world to turn to Him in prayer, to turn to Him in song, to turn to Him in, in, in really just giving Him everything that you are. See, God, God isn't about always making sense in our minds. What, what He desires from us, most of all, is our worship. So I will ask you again, what expectations of God do you need to let go of? Even the process of the wise men finding Jesus in a manger is a little strange when you think of it. It doesn't exactly fit the image of what a young king being born should have. What do I mean by that? When I think of a king being born, I think of a royal procession. I think of it happening in a palace. I think of trumpets and, and, and you know a big feast. Not some men riding on most likely stinky camels that have traveled a great distance, that haven't taken a bath and probably smell really bad, traveling in the night over a very long period of time to go to a, essentially a cave and find a baby in a manger. It's not very kingly. But for some reason, this is how God comes to us. And, and, and in that, we learn that there is right and wrong places to look for God in Christmas. See, the wise men, they started in the wrong place. They looked with their own human reasoning, like you or I often do. And what do I mean by that? 
When they saw the star, it was proclaiming that a new king, that a Messiah had been born in Israel. Where did they go? They went to Jerusalem, as the text tells us, to the palace where a king ought to be born. But it was a mistake. And because of their coming, Herod becomes jealous, and he seeks to destroy the baby king, Jesus. You and I are also tempted to look for Christmas in the wrong places. Many people find joy in giving or getting the right gift or getting together with friends and family at Christmas. This year, that may not happen for many or any of us. This year, all of the joy of those things might be ripped away. I'm not saying it is bad to give a gift or to get a gift or to get together with family and friends at Christmas time. All of those things are things to be celebrated. All of those things are things that we can find joy in. But if that is the source of our joy, many of you will be disappointed this Christmas. This year, getting together with family may not happen. This year, you may not be in a good, a good enough financial state to be able to give that perfect gift. And many people around you may also be in a similar financial state, and you may not be able to get that perfect gift this year either. If you're looking to these things for joy at Christmas, you're looking in the wrong place. You're looking in the place of Jerusalem, like where the Magi first went. The Magi looked in the right place when they looked to God. Their going to Jerusalem was not in vain. In fact, when they went there, it was through Herod that God used, <laughs> it's funny how that works, God used the man that was seeking to destroy the baby king to reveal to these wise men where to go. And they looked in the scriptures. Herod brings all of those people that were intelligent and that they knew the word of God at that time. And they, they read what the prophet Micah prophesied. That the Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem. And with this information, the wise men get back on their camel. And they follow the star to Bethlehem, until it stood over the place that Jesus was. God used the unlikely to worship and to give us a picture of what God's end goal was here. It was not by chance that God used men from a far off distant country to reveal the birth of King Jesus. God was trying to show people in that day, just as he is trying to show us again and again, that his goal is to call every nation, every tongue, every tribe to him. That he is not just in the business of calling certain people that fit into a certain mold. God's desire was not to just call Israel. God's desire is not to just call those of us that fit into the perfect church box. His desire is to call each and every one of us to him. It was to proclaim hope throughout the whole world, just as you and I are called to proclaim hope throughout the world today. Oftentimes for us to meet with God, we, we often have to divert from the agenda of, of people. Pay attention closely to what verse 3 of Matthew 2 says. It says, When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all of Jerusalem with him. Now, we can understand why King Herod was disturbed at the announcing of a Messiah being born. He was afraid he was going to lose power. He was afraid that he was going to lose prominence. But the question here is, why was Jerusalem disturbed? It says all of Jerusalem was disturbed with him. 
I'll tell you why. The Israelites hadn't heard from God in a long time, 400 years to be exact. I would argue that they were disturbed because they knew that their way of understanding things was about to change. They knew that their expectations were about to be overturned. They were afraid. Some probably afraid of God, but many of them, if not all of them, were terrified of the Romans. Because announcing a king in that day, in a country that was occupied by the Roman Empire, was dangerous. By announcing that a Messiah had been born, they were proclaiming that, essentially, there was going to be an uprising. Many of them were scared. Because they were afraid that the Romans would come, would snuff out not only this new Messiah, but all of them because they belonged to that country. They were afraid. They were afraid, and because of their fear, they were disturbed. What are you afraid of? What are you afraid of that you are content in and that you are not allowing God to change in you? Herod became determined that he was going to kill this uprising, securing his power, and in doing so, he would quiet the fears of Israel. But what does God do here? God, again, defies expectations. He gives a dream to these magi, to not return to King Herod. And after a very long journey, they find baby Jesus. And then they have to take the even longer way home to avoid Herod. See, they had to journey into the unknown because of the discovery of a Savior. So how far will you go into the unknown to discover Jesus this Christmas? How far will you allow yourself to be put in uncomfortable and unfavorable situations to find the Savior this year? Because sometimes the Savior comes out of places that we don't expect. Like Egypt. Does it make sense that God called Jesus out of Egypt? That that he, he brought Jesus to Egypt and then he called Jesus out of Egypt? back into Israel. The same country that Israel does not have a great reputation with, uh, that they were enslaved by, as the Bible tells us, and they were at war with many, many times. There, There was not peace among these nations at all times. They did not get along. So why did God bring Jesus out of Egypt? I'll tell you why. Because God is in the work of redeeming things. God desired to speak the Israelites' language, just as he desires to speak your and my language today. God used to use Jesus, and he brought Jesus out of the exact place that, Israelites ens- that the Israelites' enslavement had come from, because he is in the work of redeeming things. He wanted to remind them that even out of their toughest place, even out of the place of their enslavement, that God can bring hope, God can bring freedom, and God can bring peace. So what does God need to redeem for you this Christmas? Maybe you need to let go of where your saving is coming from. Maybe you need to let go of thinking that a certain politician or government is going to save you. Because can I just say... That's not how God works. It's never how he has worked. Because it's a common expectation of humans. And God, for some reason, doesn't like to work within our expectations. Christmas will not look the same this year. For you, for me, for any of us. And I believe that we all know this. So what are you going to do about that? Are you just going to go about doing the status quo and maintaining as much normalcy as possible this year? Or are you willing to go searching? 
What would it look like this year to create new Christmas traditions? Ones that include Jesus maybe a little bit more, and ones that include tearing down your expectations of God and what Christmas is supposed to be. Why not consider sponsoring a family this year here at New Song Church? If you don't know what I'm talking about, talk to my wife, Pastor Emily, send her a message on Facebook. Um, we want to be a blessing to our community this year. Not only just our church family, but our community. Why not consider helping at a local food bank? Why not make an extra plate this year on Christmas Day and bring it downtown to somebody begging on the side of the street? For many of us, Christmas becomes something that we just do. And can I just say that this year can be different? And if not this year, when are we going to do it? Because this is the year that we need to reclaim the redemptive story of Christmas. That is what Advent is all about. I grew up going to a church that uh, the four weeks leading up to Christmas and then on Christmas Eve, we would, we would light a candle and we would, we would sing some hymns and we would usually say prayers together as a congregation. And that was the tradition that I grew up in. But the Advent season is not about opening a calendar and eating a chocolate each day, although that can be fun. Maybe not for your waistline, but it can be fun. The Advent season is about anticipation. It's about hope. It's about love. It's about joy. It's about peace. And ultimately, it is about Christ. Because Christ is all of those things. So if not this year, when are we going to reclaim that? When are we going to reclaim hope, joy, love, and peace, and most of all, Christ? Because it is this year that I believe that the Advent season in our day and age, in our history of the modern world, that the Advent season is needed the most. Because it is a year of unmet expectations. It is a year of... For a lot of people, being void of hope, joy, love, and peace. Our world has been nothing but torn apart this year. But in so many different ways. So much disunity. There's been no peace. There hasn't been a lot of joy. And we have seen a lot more hate than we have love. What would it look like this year? For us to redeem the Advent story? What would it look like this year for us to do things differently? I don't have all the answers for that. I think that it is something that each and every one of us needs to decipher. But as a church, our desire is to give hope, peace, love, and joy. And most of all, to proclaim the message of Christ this Christmas season. So my encouragement, but also my challenge to you this Christmas season, would be to allow yourself to be put in uncomfortable situations at times. Places that might challenge the status quo inside of you, of what Christmas is supposed to be all about. Allow your expectations to be defied. Allow God to show you <laughs> that he's still working this year. Most of all, allow God to work in you. To be a better bringer of hope, joy, love, and peace. My hope and my prayer for, for you and, and for myself is that we as the church this year, would reclaim what it means to be a city on a hill. That we would be, just like what that star was for the wise men, leading people to Jesus. Shining and leading and guiding away to the baby king. My hope and my prayer is that we as the church would reclaim 
what it means to be a hope to our world, a light to our world, because our world is in desperate need of that. I believe that many of you are in desperate need of that. So if there is any way that we can help bring hope, joy, love, and peace to you this Christmas season, please reach out to us. We'd be more than willing to talk with you, to pray with you. So, be blessed this day. And remember, anticipation. This year is not all gone. It's not all forgotten. And it was not all meant for bad. This year is the year of the Lord. So let us proclaim, let us rejoice that Jesus is born. Be blessed.